the show must go on live theater and software development. So, um, hi, my name is Jacqueline Poplar, or you can call me Jackie. I currently live in Leiden in the, in the Netherlands, which is the birthplace of Rembrandt. So a uh, little about me, I have been with Booking.com for six years as a backend developer. Uh, I have been an onboarding lead and now I am a team lead. Uh, before Booking, I was at a ton of other software development and leadership positions in a bunch of different industries, oil and gas, defense, newspapers, solar energy, lots of things. But at the same time that I was doing all that, I have also had a lifelong addiction to theater. And I'm actually somewhat accomplished in that as well. I have a Master of Fine Arts in Acting, which is a terminal degree. Um, I'm a member of Actors' Equity and SAG-AFTRA, which are the professional um, actors' unions in the States. I am also a playwright, director, and producer. And again, over 20 years of experience, just like in software. I won't tell you the exact years. But over, the t over my time as an actor, playwright, director, and producer, I have learned many things, little pearls of wisdom. And I've figured out that I learned things in the theater that actually helped me at the day job. So I thought I would share some of these pearls with you. First one, know your type. When I started acting, uh, it was about a hundred years ago, I thought I could play any role, any role at all. I auditioned for everything and I couldn't understand it when I didn't get the roles I was certain I could play if I was just given the chance. But in truth, I really wasn't right for any type role. And by trying to go everywhere, I was going nowhere. And eventually, I started recognizing the roles that I did get over and over. That's me in the center in the green dress. Um, that is a, a woman who was a bit of a uh, witch, shall we say. Uh, that green dress there was made out of a curtain, a foam-backed thermal curtain. And this was done in Dallas in June, so you can imagine it was a little warm. So this is um, me on the right. It's a woman who was also a bit bitchy and a little bit crazy. By the way, this is not a black and white photo. This is a color photo. The play was in black and white. Uh, we're wearing many, many layers of gray makeup. And so I was a German spy posing as a Russian, or I think it might've been the other way around. Not quite sure. And then there, this is me full out crazy. This is my other type, the frumpy type. Uh, this is me as Harriet Stanley in the, the crazy aunt who's in the attic from the man who came to dinner. And uh, that thing around my shoulders was unfortunately a real dead fox. It was pretty gross. But the point is that I found what I could do. I found those roles that were me. That was my area of expertise. I established myself and that gave me the opportunity to start branching out from there once I figured it out. And so for the branching out part, let's look at some more famous people. Okay, so this guy became very successful as the hapless hysterical father on Malcolm in the Middle. He's the goofy dad in a perpetual midlife crisis. But then later, this guy, Brian Cranston, became Walter White in Breaking Bad. Totally different type. Also very successful. Okay, so when Tim, Gert, uh, Tim Burton cast Michael Keaton as Batman, people thought that that was pretty crazy. Michael Keaton was known for silly comic roles like Beetlejuice and Mr. Mom and Johnny Dangerously, but nobody could see him as Batman. And it was a definite stretch, but it did work. He's created one of the top Batmans or Batmen or whatever. And not everyone has been so lucky. George Clooney was romantic comedy TV medical drama, but he was not Batman. So whether you find yourself you're in a musical, but you can't really sing, or playing a classically educated warrior king like you're a blonde Irish surfer dude, or portraying Genghis Khan, but still you're an American cowboy, at least you know you tried something. And keep trying because sometimes it will work. If you play the nice guy and now you play a bad guy, or you're known for being a beauty and you're playing a beast, 
or you go from jock to joker, you found a new type you can play, another tool for the toolbox, and now you can master that. So know your type. Master your type. Find out what you do really well and do that. And then do it better and better. And then branch out from there. Find another thing you can master, maybe you know front end, maybe full stack, maybe big data, whatever. You may fail along the way, but that's okay because you won't have millions of people watching you do that. Pearl number two, yes and. Okay, so for many years, I was part of an improvisational comedy troupe in Dallas. Uh, this is from our very, very early days before we changed the name to ad libs and we won lots of awards. Yes and comes from improv, but it applies whenever you are generating ideas with others. So like when you're brainstorming. So mostly when we do an improv scene, we get suggestions from the audience. For example, we're gonna do a short improv and we're gonna build a little story. And for this, you can unmute and yell something out when you, when you think of it. Okay, so first, I need an activity you might do on a day off. Anybody? Watch TV? Hiking. Watch TV, that's the first thing I heard. Yes, watch TV. Okay, um, and, and you're with somebody, who are you with? Your brother. Your brother. Okay. We're with your brother and you're in a big hurry to watch the show because something is about to happen. What? What is going to happen? Fall over. Fall over. No, no, no. That's not it. That's not the idea. Are you more or less likely to offer suggestions once I've started saying no? Yeah, did I kill the energy by saying no? Before it was yes, yes and, yes and, yes and, and all of a sudden, no. Right? It just kind of deflates you. So yes and is about accepting the contributions of others. It's about respecting what others have to say. It's not about immediately judging the idea, but it, and it's about not killing that flow of ideas. So, yes and. Accept the ideas you hear with yes and. Build with yes and. And remember that no kills the flow. There's always plenty of time for judging. Sometimes it takes getting through the not so good ideas to get to the really good ideas. Say yes and to get to those really good ideas. Pearl three, all the world's a stage. So whenever, um, I'm normally a back-end developer, uh, but occasionally I do some uh, front-end work. Um, I've done some really, some really cool things and I've never had the luxury of having a designer. I, it's always just me, but so I think of a user interface, I think of it as, um, I think the page as my stage or the screen as my stage. So the, the biggest difference between directing a film and directing theater is that in film, you have almost total control of what the audience sees. You can go to a wide shot if you want them to see the whole big world, or you go to a close up if you want them to just focus on like the face or the expression or something like that. But in the theater, you can't really do that. You have lighting, you have scenery, you can light one part of the stage and not the other. You can use flats or whatever to limit what the audience sees, but those approaches are really expensive in terms of time and equipment. And there are limits to what you can do. Uh, so when I'm directing for stage, I want to get the audience to steer the audience. Uh, I want to get the audience to steer their attention somewhere. So if everything has equal focus, you don't really know where to look and your eye kind of scans across the page, right? So you look at that picture and, and your eye just kind of wants to go back and forth. And even if you add a fancy background, it's still kind of the same thing. It doesn't really help all that much. Who is important here? Who is the main character here? Where do I need to look? So how can you direct the audience's eye to what you want them to focus on? 
Directors work on creating stage pictures to emphasize specific characters or to create a mood. One technique is through color, like yellow or purple or red. Here, the colors of the costumes are coordinated so that only one character pops. And of course, you see this a lot, especially on the Booking.com website, where we'll use, we'll agonize over the color of a button or the color of text uh, to uh, draw your attention in. We do massive experiments, lots of experiments on figuring out the color of your text. So another technique is using the other actors on the stage to steer the focus to a central character or characters. So you see the five girls on the left are all looking at the girl on the right. And so your eye kind of follows them along to look at her. Here also, you see all the energy directed at Alexander Hamilton in the center. Here is a couple in the center, but all the attention on the side is being paid to the, the couple. So even if you like look to the side, your eye is kind of bounced back to the focal point. Here's another thing that they're using arms, the arms of the actors to be like vectors pointing to the main attraction. Doesn't always work really well. I don't think in this one, <laughs> I think this is a little confusing. Um, but if you do it right, the picture you create can be very powerful. What I really like about this picture from Hamilton is that the arms of the chorus, like those out to the side, and then the arm of Alexander Hamilton form the top of the star, if you look at it right. And that's the logo of the show. But here it's very clear where you're supposed to be looking. There's no, no question. So your user interface is your canvas your stage. There's some very interesting techniques that theater directors use that can be an inspiration in your next user interface. So when theater comes back, and I really hope it does so very soon, go see some shows and ask yourself how your focus is being directed. Pay attention to color. Think about what, this, what story it is telling you. Look at the lines and the shapes, and then go have fun with your stage or your page or whatever. Pearl four. Always be audition ready. So there's a saying that an actor is only as good as their last role. Permanent employment is just not really a thing for actors, even if you're on a long running TV show or uh, you're in one of the very few remaining resident theater companies, you're always looking for your next gig, always. And it's a very stressful experience, even if you're auditioning regularly, even if you but if you haven't done an audition or like a job interview in a while, just the thought of it can be quite terrifying. You need to have your set of audition monologues ready to go at the drop of a hat. Nothing is scarier than hearing, hey, do you have something else when you only have that one monologue in your brain? You have to be really familiar with the plays that are out there, especially the ones you're auditioning for. And you have to come in with energy and confidence. So always being ready for the next audition is a good mindset for software developers as well. We may be happy where we are right now, but things are constantly changing. You have to be ready to get your next gig if you have to. So keep your CV and LinkedIn profiles up to date. Learn what the skills are that will get you hired and practice. Do coding problems, do practice interviews, teach. The important thing is to stay in touch with what's outside your work scope. I don't know about you, but I, you know, don't really balance uh, trees or graphs day to day, only in interviews. Number five, make your own opportunities. So we get very used to waiting. We tell ourselves that we're waiting for the right moment, but really we're waiting to feel good enough or prepared enough, waiting for someone to recognize our potential, waiting for permission. We have to let go of the waiting. We have to create what we want to see. So this is my friend, this is my friend, Sarah Cooper. 
we met doing a show in New York about 10 years ago. She was doing, she was doing stand up. She created a blog. She did whatever she could to get noticed. She self published her first book. This was based on her uh, experience at Google where she worked. Uh, then she went on to create more books. Now she's also, uh, she's really hit it big with her TikTok videos. I don't want to get really political here. Um, look her up if you don't know who she is, but she's getting her own Netflix special. This is Phoebe Waller-Bridge. You may know her from Fleabag. She adapted her one woman show, which she performed at the 2013 Edinburgh Fringe Festival. The initial idea of this came from a challenge from a friend where Phoebe had to create a sketch for like a 10 minute section in a stand up storytelling night. It started out that small, but she developed the character, she developed the story, she grew it into a pilot and then into a series and then into a ton of awards. So make your own opportunities. No one is going to come along and say, hey, you have potential, let me help you. No magical fairy is gonna tap their, tap their wand on you and say, you now have permission to do your own thing, do it. Work on open source code, create an app, write a book or a blog or a presentation, add to the universe. And then finally, number six, the show must go on. All right, so I've cast you all in a show. You're, you're welcome. You start work on this no, new show, just like any new project. And the cast, you, together with the cast, get together for the first read through. It's an exciting time full of expectations and hope. Everyone has their uh, new role to play, but there's a bit of sizing up that goes on. You know, just like you start a project. You ask yourself, will I get along with these people? Will we be able to work well together? Or will there be a conflict? Will someone turn out to be a diva? Will the diva be me? And so you start the rehearsal process. Rehearsals are important. This is where all the work gets done. And not just for the technical aspects of the show. You walk there, you hit, sit here, look for your light, all that stuff. But to create that environment of trust with your fellow actors. It's about commitment. It's about being professional. Okay, so after the regular rehearsals, which may or may not be fraught with drama beyond that of the show, there comes the dreaded tech week. This is it. This is where it all comes together. You've been safe in the rehearsal room with your stand-in props and your rehearsal costumes, but now you move to the stage, to the real set. It's mayhem. The lighting designer you met once at the read-through is now barking orders at you. Uh, people are standing on really tall ladders. It's, there's real furniture all of a sudden. Come seems much smaller than when you tried it on. The days are really, really long, frustrating, but it's all do or die. Will the hard work pay off? Will this mess turn into a show? And it does. No matter how bad it seems, it always does. Opening night is magical. It's when everything comes together in a way you thought impossible just the day before. The magic happens because the work you put in together, the ensemble is the key. You may have your differences, differences. you may throw darts at your co-star's picture at home, but you put all that aside for the good of the show, for the project, because your audience, your customer deserves it. And because the show must go on. Start with a good team. Commit to the work that needs to be done. Be professional in everything you do and the magic will happen. Theater is my passion, it has always been. And yet, yeah, 
wonderful people and where comes and becomes. But theater is really where I learn about life. And there are many other bits of wisdom we had actors hear over and over in our careers. Some of them are practical, some of them are very annoying. I don't bring them all to work, <laughs> but not bumping into the furniture is always wise. But I do find these pearls of wisdom here at work uh, useful. Knowing my type, saying yes and, seeing all the world as a stage, always being audition ready, making my own opportunities and believing that the show must go on. Thank you. Thanks for that, Jackie. Um, I think that was a really interesting perspective. And uh, we do have a few questions in the chat, so I'm just gonna run through them with you now. Interesting point about teaching. Could you elaborate on how teaching can benefit our own development? You never really learn something well until you teach it. When you're learning, you're just taking it all in, taking it all in, oh, how can I use that? But when you are trying to boil down the core of the concept so that somebody else gets it, then you will really know it inside and out. So I, uh, with my onboarders that would start, like their first two months of booking, I would make them do half hour presentations. So they would teach us something either they learned during their onboarding tasks or something they learned at other companies and their other uh, experience. But it just gets you to focus on in on what are the really important points that people need to know. What would you suggest is the best way as a software developer to create your own opportunities? Well, work outside, you can work outside your company. You can write libraries, you can commit to uh, open source. I mentioned teaching, also mentoring, um, both mentoring somebody else and being mentored. Reach out, network, find people just outside of your small realm at work and think beyond work. Another question. Uh, so she said, a very beautiful and original approach. The competition out there is pretty fierce and people become aggressive about it. How mm. do you deal with doubting yourself? Yeah, that's a really, really good point, especially for women. Because we're taught early on that um, we're not supposed to be software developers. We're not supposed to be good at math. We're not supposed to do all these things. When I started, it wasn't quite that because this was, you know, back in when dinosaurs roamed the earth, but there were a lot more women um, percentage wise in software development. This was before the personal computer came out, which kind of changed everything. The most important thing is to know that you know what you know, if that makes sense. The more you can prepare, the more you are sure that, okay, I have study this i have worked with this i am skilled with this people can't take that from you and i know there's a lot of people they just like throw the buzzwords out there and you know try to appear smart and stuff but just be confident that they're probably just throwing out buzzwords and you know what you're talking about because you've used it and that's it again it's knowing your type ma mastering something first so you can be confident. And another question. <laughs> um, so from Helene, so she's recently been made redundant due to COVID-19 and still junior with under a year's experience. Um, I think that's resulted in quite a knock of confidence. So what's your number one tip? I mean, to be honest, I think there's so much recruiting going on right now. I mean, yeah, some industries are really suffering, but others are hiring like crazy because for all the people that are shut up at home, they have to um, communicate through the internet. They have to buy their groceries. They have to do all those things. So there are jobs out there. I don't think you should feel worried about a shortage of, of software jobs. I think they're there. 
So the best thing to do is practice. Do um, if you're a coder. I don't know if you didn't mention, but if you're like a, a software developer, um, get yourself this book, <laughs> Cracking the Coding Interview. Do practice problems um, like Interview Cake. Um, that they have problems for all sorts of things, and you can practice and you can get scored. Practice with your friends doing interviews. You know, have somebody, have a friend interview you so you can get that into your into your psyche right there. That's really the important thing. And about so confidence. Actors never have confidence. I mean, in those auditions, you have to go in and you have to pretend to have all this confidence and your knees are shaking and you're scared to death. So just fake it. Just fake it. Just tell yourself, you know what? I am confident. You you won't believe it, but that's okay. Just say it and go. You'll be fine. Do you also happen to bring some insights from your developer work to your acting work? If Definitely. yes, what? Oh, definitely. In fact, um, I taught um, at Penn State University where I got my master's degree. I would teach acting for non-majors. And one of the things I like to do is to incorporate everybody's major into how I taught acting. Uh, physics worked especially well, you know, like for every action, there was an equal and opposite reaction and stuff like that. But one of the most important things I learn, I bring from software development is that teamwork aspect, which goes both ways. I brought it from theater to um, work. I do it the other way around. And also, um, it's kind of weird, but that, that boiling down of what the important thing that happens, like when you're creating a method, you're creating a function, you have to know something comes in, something happens to it and something else comes out and you don't want to have a lot of wasteful stuff in there right it should just do what it needs to do and get out you're not gonna you know alphabetize a bunch of words just for fun in the middle of the function no but this, the, the same thing is true when i write theater is i figure out this is what happens at the beginning this is what needs to happen at the end and everything else makes a logical progression I know it sounds weird, but that's... From your perspective, dinosaurs, what happened to industry that made it somewhat unfriendly to women? It was, um, and, and this is documented, I've read about this, but I also lived through it, so I recognize it. Before about the early 90s, like 92, 93, um, if people had access to computers, it was because uh, they were at school or something that there was a frame. There was, um, you couldn't have one in your house. So everybody had equally bad access to a computer. Then what happened is in the early 90s, when personal computers came out, they were still very expensive. So you didn't have any like, I have now six computers just on my desk, but it's, you know, back then you had one. And that one computer in a family would be reserved for the boy so that he could get the good job. And the girl could maybe steal a little bit of time here and there, but it was the boy's computer. And this happened for a while until the prices went down enough. But at that, that's what software development started becoming the boy's profession. And the girls were kind of shoved out of the way. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I mean, I think we can all agree it was uh, yeah, really interesting and it's good to see it from a different perspective too.